Okay, let's get started. I've got a lot to cover today. Uh, I'm going to talk about JRuby and some of the cool stuff we have coming up in the future here. Uh, I'm Charles Nutter, Charlie, to you, that's fine with me. Uh, there's my contact information. Been doing JRuby development for a long time now, uh, over 15 years, and uh, nearly 20 years, getting close. Uh, and I've been doing full-time JRuby development since about 2006, first with Sun Microsystems and then Engine Yard. And then, of course, for the last 10 years, uh, we've been very thankful that Red Hat has continued to sponsor the work that we're doing to make JRuby better. So what about JRuby? Uh, how many people here have never heard of JRuby? Okay, there's a few folks. Good. Uh, there'll be a lot of content for, for every, everybody that's new to it and people that know JRuby. But of course, JRuby is uh, Ruby on top of the Java Virtual Machine, the JVM. Uh, we are always trying to be a Ruby implementation first. So we focus on uh, the user experience, the command line, the compatibility of Ruby, and then do integration with the JVM as a, a secondary sort of feature. Uh, we expect that any Ruby code that's out there, pure Ruby code, should just work on JRuby. Uh, let us know if anything doesn't work properly, but uh, we have a very high level of compatibility. Uh, we do have a different extension API. We don't support Sanders C extensions that regular Ruby does. Uh, we don't support forking because the JVM doesn't do it. And we do actually have parallel threads. So that's a little bit more to think about when you're, you're building an application. But we've been in use for a long time, over 15 years of production users. Uh, thousands of companies all over the world use JRuby. And uh, we're very excited to, to be uh, successful in that way. So I want to take a step back and ask about uh, what is it that's really important for a Ruby implementation? Uh, now, of course, everybody always talks about performance or garbage collection or straight line execution, uh, but there's a lot of other aspects. There's the usability aspects, compatibility, the startup time, how does it feel to use it? Uh, runtime features like the garbage collector, the JIT that you might have, uh, tooling on that platform. The features of the platform itself, being able to build server applications and deploy them widely, being able to build desktop applications, uh, integration with the platform. And then, of course, performance is a thing, but performance has many different aspects. There's straight line performance, there's scaling across many resources, uh, and all of these play into applications differently. So getting started with JRuby, pretty easy. Uh, you can certainly go to our website and find some more information, jruby.org. Uh, we generally, there's only two steps, and we generally just recommend that you install a JDK, and then usually whatever Ruby installer you're used to, Ruby install or RVM, uh, that'd be the quickest way to get up and going on JRuby. You also can just download the tarball that we ship, unpack it, and you've got JRuby running on your system. Test it out. Here's JRuby with IRB. Uh, we are just calling into some Java libraries here. So this is the Java Lang runtime class. We get an instance of the runtime. We ask how many processors there are, how much memory is free on the system, and so on. Uh, now we're up and running in JRuby. So let's first talk about that area of usability. Uh, and the most important aspect for us is always to be as compatible as possible. Uh, so we have JRuby 9.4, which is the current re release cycle that we're on. That's 3.1 compatible. We released it uh, about four months ago, five months ago, around the, Ruby, around the time of RubyConf in the US. Uh, very good compatibility. We're still working out a few edge cases, but most users are very happy with how it's, how it's feeling right now. We will maintain JRuby 9.3 for a while uh, with Ruby 2.6 compatibility, but I assume most people have moved beyond that at this point. And for example, Rails 7 requires Ruby 2.7 or higher, so uh, we're kind of stuck on that. Uh, and then later this year, we'll be working on JRuby 9.5, which will include a whole bunch of new optimizations as well as Ruby 3.2 compatibility. Uh, here is a chart created by uh, Benoit of the, the Truffle Ruby project uh, showing the compatibility levels based on Ruby specs. Uh, how many Ruby specs do we pass? And JRuby, we're happy to say, is very high up here on the uh, command line features and the compatibility of the language features itself, 98% compatible. I think uh, some of the features that are missing in language compatibility is flip-flops that I'm kind of just leaving it unimplemented to see if anybody ever actually files a bug for it. Uh, but so far, no, nobody's had any problem with it. Very high compatibility in the core libraries as well here. Uh, standard library shows up a little lower here because there's a number of C extensions in the standard library we don't support. But for the ones that are there that are not C extensions, we, we support them well. 
The other aspect of uh, uh, usability that we often have concerns about is startup time. It's probably the number one complaint for people using JRuby. Uh, we're kind of fighting an uphill battle here. The JVM just isn't design designed to start up quickly. Most of the core JDK classes start out interpreted in the JVM. And then JRuby makes this a little bit worse by parsing all the Ruby code with our, with our parser that's interpreted on the JVM. Our compiler is interpreted. Our Ruby interpreter is interpreted by the JVM. Eventually things get up and going. We turn it into bytecode, the JVM jits, but it takes a long time for that to happen. Let's take a look at this more graphically. Uh, here's the architecture of JRuby today. We pull in Ruby code on the left. That goes into our parser and compiler and gets turned into Ruby intermediate representation that we have, or our instructions. Uh, that we will interpret for a while in our interpreter until it looks like the code is hot enough that we want to turn it into JVM bytecode. Then we do that compilation generate JVM bytecode for that Ruby code using features like invoke dynamic to optimize it. Uh, and then the JVM takes it from there and runs through its cycle. It interprets our bytecode for a while. It'll do a quick optimization. It'll do a more aggressive optimization later on. And these will cycle over time. As the application runs, it will eventually optimize various aspects of it. So what this adds up to is significantly slower startup uh, for, say, a hello world command, uh, here taking uh, over, over one and a half seconds for what CRuby would do in uh, 53 milliseconds. Obviously, this is not ideal. So one of the first ways that we've been tackling this is to simply do less of these optimizations, try to get to a final stage more quickly, and that's where we have JRuby's dev mode. You can pass dash dash dev to JRuby, and it cuts out our JIT, it tunes the JVM's JIT to be a little less aggressive, and it can help speed up some of these command line operations. Here it is with the hello world, the dash E1. Uh, get a little bit of an improvement here, about 25%. It has more of an impact on longer running commands. So here's JRuby generating a Rails application, uh, well over 50% improvement with dash dash dev. Now we're also uh, looking at and hearing about uh, the possibility of ahead of time compiling things for the for the JVM or for the Java platform. Uh, the Graal VM native image compiler is probably the best known here. It's what Truffle Ruby uses to get their startup time down. Uh, we're also looking forward to a project called Leiden uh, on the OpenJDK team that will bring more, a, a standardized ahead of time compile that allows us to keep running new code and re-optimizing still. So this definitely does help for, for small commands. Here's an example with Truffle Ruby uh, in their JVM mode taking 2.3 seconds, using their native executable and some additional tricks, getting that down actually faster than CRuby's startup. But the problem here is that this is really only your baseline startup. We still have to end up loading and interpreting Ruby code and optimizing it. So we take a look at a longer running command. Uh, now our dash dash dev flag is actually doing a better job cutting down startup time than the native compile. So there's different things that we have to balance when we're speeding up startup time. Uh, now the last area that we're looking at for improving startup time is uh, snapshotting. Uh, there's a feature on Linux called Checkpoint and Restore in User Space uh, that's now starting to be integrated into JVMs like IBM's uh, Semaru. Uh, we have a working prototype of this using the checkpointing and restoring to speed up JRuby. So the idea here is that we start up the JVM, we do some operations to warm up JRuby so it compiles itself and it gets uh, a little bit more loaded into the system, and then we take a, a snapshot, a checkpoint, save that to disk. And then every time we go to start up JRuby again, we start from that point with an already warm VM, and it gets much faster. Uh, in the quick experiments that we did, here is JRuby using checkpointing for the hello world command. It's definitely getting down to the point where it's com uh, competitive with CRuby's startup time. And it actually does apply uh, to larger commands like generating a new application here. Again, now we're getting down under a second, probably not gonna be the main concern for you. So hopefully checkpointing will, will help us uh, finally solve some of the JVM startup issues. Okay, so let's talk about some of the runtime features that really make JRuby interesting. Uh, and of course we have all of the JVM GCs that are available to us, and new ones keep coming out every day it seems like. 
Uh, they're tunable in lots of different ways. You might use the parallel garbage collector if you just want fast allocations, straight line uh, object allocation to go very quickly. If you have a large data set, you might run uh, one, one of the others like G1 or ZGC that are better at handling a lot of old data and memory and reducing the pause times when it does have to do garbage collection. Uh, several of these are built into OpenJDK and you can use them with JRuby just by passing a flag. Here's an example of one of the tools we can use on the JVM. This is Visual VM with a live view of the garbage collector operating. Uh, on the left side, we can see things like CPU usage, uh, the number of classes that have been loaded into the system, the number of threads. And on the right side, we see the garbage collector generations actually filling up, clearing out, and promoting old objects. And now, of course, the JVM has a world-class JIT. Uh, the Hotspot JVM, Hotspot in OpenJDK, is the most widely deployed JVM JIT out there. Uh, it has a couple different tiers that it uses to do quick optimization at the beginning, more aggressive optimizations later on. Uh, we're also playing with the Graal JIT, which is a JIT that's part of the Graal VM, can be plugged into the JVM and used to do more aggressive optimizations. Uh, sometimes if you're doing numeric algorithms, that can speed JRuby up substantially. Um, other applications, we haven't seen it gain, but uh, it's an interesting project we're, we're still playing with. And then there's other JVMs like OpenJ9, which is IBM Semeru, has their own JIT. They can save a compiled classes off to disk between runs, so future executions will be quicker. Also playing with that feature to try and speed up JRuby startup time. Uh, monitoring and profiling features, uh, I showed Visual VM already. Uh, the other tool I wanted to show is the flight recorder feature of the JVM, which is uh, driven by uh, an application, a GUI application called Mission Control. Uh, here is the view of, in Mission Control showing the running JVMs on the system. If I select the JRuby, uh, in JRuby application, I can start a recording. When that recording finishes, it will show me things like objects being allocated. So I can see if there's excess allocations. I can trace these back to a specific line of code in Ruby or in JRuby to see where we're doing these object allocations. Uh, we can see hot methods, and this can also be filtered to only show the Ruby methods and which ones are being hit the hardest in the application. Uh, and we can monitor the threads. Here we can see number of different threads running in the system. I think I was monitoring the, uh, a Rails benchmark, Rails blog post application. Uh, you can see most of the threads are executing. Some of them are sitting here sleeping. Uh, and then there's a bunch of threads internal to the JVM. Now, one of the features that's really exciting coming up in, JVM, in, in the JVM world is called Project Loom. Uh, so a little background, JRuby implements the, the fiber class in Ruby, but since we don't have any way to control the call stack on the JVM, we've had to s simulate fibers using a native thread. Uh, now, of course, this, this doesn't work if we're trying to spin up thousands or tens of thousands of fibers because most systems just won't let you launch that many threads. It takes up too many resources. So Project Loom actually brings real fibers, native fibers to the JVM, and we can build off of that to finally have lightweight threading, lightweight fiber support. So a little benchmark here that shows part of the problem with the current set of fibers. Here I'm gonna create 100,000 fibers uh, that all immediately just yield. Uh, they, each one of these will then resume and let them all execute. This is what happens on JRuby. Try to run 100,000 threads without using Project Loom. If you're lucky, you'll get an error. Most likely, you'll actually just crash JRuby completely. It's trying to do too many threads, the JVM's just not built for it, and the operating system will kick it out. Now, I have integrated support for Loom. It's in current builds of JRuby, current releases of JRuby. Uh, it was actually a pretty trivial change. I was amazed how easy it was. Here, I'm taking our old call that called into a thread pool, a native thread pool, and said, start running another fiber, just replace that with what they call virtual threads in Project Loom. All I had to do was make this change, and suddenly we actually have 100,000 fibers starting up, resuming, and executing, executing to completion in a very rapidly, very short amount of time. So this opens up all sorts of new possibilities for us. Uh, at, Ruby Kaigi in the past, uh, Samuel iAquatics has presented uh, his visions for uh, C100K or C1 million K, being able to handle 100,000 
sockets at the same time in a single Ruby process. We'll be able to support this now, and I've already started trying to add the features we need to get uh, async, uh, IO event, async IO, and the whole stack up to the Falcon server to work on JRuby. And this would be a great way for someone to contribute if you want to help fill out some of these missing features. Now, the last runtime feature that I wanted to mention is uh, called Project Panama. This is also coming along. Uh, and this is going to bring native foreign functions, native, uh, native ability to call C libraries to the JVM. Uh, so we do have a foreign function interface in JRuby, uh, which we use to, to uh, support all the POSIX libraries that are out there. Uh, I think s certain database drivers use this, like SQLite. Uh, what we're going to have with Panama is that the JVM will also optimize those calls. Rather than going through the JVM's very heavy native interface, uh, we might be able to make these calls directly and speed up how we use native libraries. Uh, it also comes with a foreign memory API, so we'll be able to work with uh, off-heap memory much more efficiently. Uh, and probably the coolest part for me, it has a tool that you just point at a header file and it generates code for you. That, that tool's called jextract. Uh, the problem with doing FFI is writing those bindings by hand is very tiresome, very slow process. Uh, the parameter sizes be, are gonna be different. You need to map all the shape of the struct properly, all of the parameters and the functions, and then you need to do it for another platform and another platform, because they all may do things slightly differently. Uh, so jextract provides the opportunity for us to generate all, the, all of that binding code automatically at runtime. So you can take a JRuby application, you can point it at a header file, it'll generate code and make that native library callable. Uh, so here is an example from JExtract's uh, homepage here. Uh, we've got a struct, a 2D point with X and Y, and we'll calculate a distance. We do our jextract. This is running it at the command line. We can also do this at runtime and generate all the code in memory. And it dumps out some, this is Java code that can call this library now, call this function. Uh, but this is also, just like any other piece of Java code, directly callable from JRuby. So we can use this tool now to generate bindings for native functions and call them in JRuby. In the future, we'll use this to back up our own FFI and make native calls a lot faster. Okay, uh, so this is really interesting to us because like I mentioned, the SQLite JDBC adapter we use right now currently goes through that heavy Java native interface. Uh, that ends up impacting performance if you're depending on running SQLite. There's already a proof of concept of the SQLite driver using Panama, which gives you about two times performance improvement uh, right out of the box. We're also working on integrating the YARP, uh, yet another Ruby parser, the project that's been, been talked about a bit here. I think right after this talk, uh, Kevin will be doing a presentation. Uh, we have already got a lot of this integrated. Uh, Tom said about 60% of the AST nodes are already implemented and hooked up to JRuby. Uh, in our early tests, it's about 20% faster than starting up our own parser. And uh, right now we are using JNI, but this is another case where Panama would be great. All we have to do is point it at the library for YARP, generate some code, and then we can access it more quickly. All right, so now more fun stuff that we can do. Uh, one of the real advantages of the JVM is the fact that we have support for lots of cross-platform GUI libraries. Uh, probably the most commonly known is Swing, which is the a pure Java set of widgets that you can use to build desktop applications. Ships with OpenJDK and it's available on every platform, so it's a very easy way to get started. Uh, there's also the scalable windowing toolkit, which is called S is, is a part of the Eclipse project, Eclipse SWT. And this uh, provides wrappers around native widgets. So if you want a desktop application that looks a little bit more like other Windows applications or other Mac OS applications, you can use SWT. And then the, probably the newest one, uh, JavaFX, which is more of a scene-building GUI library, sort of like, like building Flash applications way back when or building applications for the web. Uh, this is uh, f another free project. It's not shipped with OpenJDK, but it's just a couple libraries you need to pull down. We also have a JRubyFX project that wraps JavaFX and allows you to build applications uh, using, uh, using Ruby code to drive JavaFX. 
Uh, there are some other wrappers out there that make these a little easier for Rubyists to use. Uh, Shoes 4 is actually the, the latest iteration of why the Lucky Stiff's uh, shoes library for doing simple GUIs. Uh, and this wraps, I believe, Swing under the covers. Glimmer is a much more feature-full, feature-rich uh, graphical widget library that wraps several backends, like SWT and GTK. Uh, it really makes it easy to build applications that are cross-platform, and it's been, been, been designed to be really nice for Ruby users as well. And then, of course, I mentioned JRubyFX. Here's a little bit of the code. We build up our scene in different layers, uh, and then we can run it through the JRuby or the JavaFX runtime. Now, of course, if we're talking about graphical user interfaces, uh, probably at least half of the people in here have a, a, a graphical computer in their pocket in the form of an Android phone. Uh, and we are updating Rubato. Uh, Rubato is JRuby's support for Android, uh, provides uh, tooling and wrappers around the, some of the Android APIs, so you can build your application entirely in Ruby. Uh, one of the classic examples of that here is uh, uh, Rubato IRB. Here is a, a version of Rubato IRB running on my phone. Uh, we have an interactive REPL here, an IRB that runs there, of course. You also can go and look at some of the example scripts. You can edit these scripts, and then you can run them right in the application. Uh, this is not currently in the store because of all the permissions we requested. It was too much. They thought it was a concern. Uh, but we are going to republish it under the newer security requirements, so it, it should be out there soon. Until then, you can search for the APKs and just install them. Uh, we're, like I mentioned, we are updating this. The uh, Rubato IRB that you see here is an old version of JRuby 1.7, so it's like 1.9 compatible as far as Ruby goes. But we are updating it for JRuby 9.4. You'll have Ruby 3.1 compatibility, and we're, we're getting pretty close to having everything working again. Uh, this is a demo application in the JRuby 9000 proof of concept. Uh, this final one with active record is the only one that doesn't fully work at this point. All right. So wrapping up here with the last area I want to talk about, uh, performance and scaling. So this has been a, a, a classic problem for deploying applications on CRuby. Uh, you have no concurrent threads, no, no parallel threading at the native operating system level. Uh, so we have to do worker processes. And now there's, there's tricks like copy on write and preloading and uh, other servers that you can use. But eventually, what you're talking about here is wasting resources across these processes. Even if you're able to cut that memory footprint way down, you've still got multiple JITs running. You've got multiple GCs running. You've got multiple heaps that you're managing. And that's wasting a lot of work. GC is like one big heap if you can do it. And that is generally how we want things to run. Now, we believe JRuby is probably the best solution right now for this. Uh, you can run a single process on your server, scale it up to as many users as you want, tens, hundreds, thousands of users, uh, and it will use roughly the same memory footprint all the way. So for a benchmark here, I'm just using a baseline Rails application, just generating the classic blog post app, uh, creating one blog post, and then just trying to hit it as much as I can. Uh, running on an 8 CPU IBM VPC, 32 gig of memory, doesn't need anywhere near that for these demonstrations. Uh, and then with JRuby 16 threads for 16 way concurrency and on CRuby 16 workers. Uh, and then the caveat here, database, the benchmark driver all running on the same system as well. So it's not super scientific, but it gives you an idea. So here we have it running with uh, JRuby, CRuby 3.2, and then also adding in uh, YJIT uh, as, as it exists in 3.2.2, I think is the release I, I ran here. Uh, you can see the warm up time, the warm up curve for JRuby takes a little bit. Each one of these nodes on the bottom, uh, on the x axis here, is the uh, 60 second iteration of as many requests as possible. So we take a while to warm up, but we do eventually end up running faster even than YJIT. Although, you know, kudos to the YJIT team. I'm really excited that we're seeing this kind of performance improvement uh, on a CRuby JIT now. So that translates to this. Uh, JRuby's still up at the top there with the most requests per second. But I remember I said performance has a lot of different dimensions. And probably the biggest one here is memory usage. 
by default, the JVM will use as much memory as it can. It'll be real large, it'll take a big heap so it has lots of room to breathe. And that means this JRuby example takes about, takes about 3.4, 3 almost 3.5 uh, gigabytes of memory. Now we can tell the JVM not to be so aggressive about how much memory it uses. If I tell it to use a 300 megabyte heap, then it drops down to a, under a gig that it's using in memory. Uh, C Ruby here, uh, without YJIT, using about 1.6 gigabytes. YJIT currently has some additional memory overhead, bumped it up to two gigabytes, uh, but my understanding is that that's improving too. So here, you see that the JRuby result with the smaller heap did reduce performance slightly, uh, but not, not a whole lot, and now we're running in a much more comfortable size of memory. We could run it on a smaller instance and pay less for it. Uh, but the other dimension of this is to see how, what kind of requests per second do we get for each megabyte of data that we, uh, megabyte of RAM that we add into the system here. So with JRuby without any tuning, with the 3.4 gigabytes, we're only getting about a half a request per second for each megabyte of memory that we're paying for. Here with the tuning, JRuby doing much better, 1.72 requests per second for every megabyte that you've added. And then if we carry this up, this is just a 16-way app. What if it was 160 uh, concurrent users? Now we start to see where the real benefits come in. So this is JRuby doing much, much better than CRuby on scaling with the same amount of memory. And this will scale up as far as you can go, as many threads as the system can support. And that translates to real money. The, money, the, the, the cash that you pay for your cloud services is almost all spent on renting that space in memory. And the more you can get out of that memory that's, that you're renting, the better your application will be. All right, so wrapping up, JRuby futures here. Uh, 9.4 continues to stabilize. We're really excited how the reception has been. It's being adopted and run in production all over the world already. Give it a try, let us know if you run into anything. Uh, now that we're kind of caught up on compatibility, we're also gonna be taking a step back and looking at optimizations we haven't done for, uh, for many years. Uh, 9.5, like I said, hopefully later this year, uh, probably gonna require a minimum of Java 17, uh, but then we'll bring in Ruby 3.2 features and again, another big round of optimizations. Uh, hopefully this has showed you that there's so many aspects of JRuby and the JVM that we're just starting to leverage. Uh, Project Loom and Panama, the Android stuff we've got going, desktop development, lots of things that we can do. So whatever you're interested in, I think JRuby can help you. So give it a try, uh, let us know how it goes, and I will see you around the conference. Thank you. And I do have some, uh, a limited set of JRuby stickers for anybody who wants them, so come and see me afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>